Welcome to the wicket. Yes, it's time for another episode of the Wicked Arab News' very own cricketing podcast. I'm your host, Brian Murgatroyd, and with me as ever to discuss what's happening in the sport locally in the Gulf, regionally in Asia and worldwide, Arab News columnist John Pike and Arab News cricket reporter Sebash Hamagain. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, Brian. Hello, Sebash. Hi, John. Hello, Brian. And in this episode, we reflect upon the closing stages of the ICC Men's T20 World Cup in the USA and the Caribbean, including a classic final between India and South Africa. Plus, we look at both semi-finals and we assess the tournament as a whole. We discuss three women's series, one of which between Sri Lanka and the West Indies has just finished, with two others, that's India against South Africa and England versus New Zealand, still very much ongoing. We talk about the resignation of Sri Lanka men's head coach, Chris Silverwood. We assess the England squad for the start of its uh, test summer against the West Indies at Lords. We look ahead to the start of season two two of Major League Cricket in the USA. And on top of that, as ever, Sebastian and John tell us what's caught their attention over the past week in cricket. Plenty to pick apart then, so let's get underway. The Men's ICC T20 World Cup has wrapped up and it finished with a fantastic match between the two previously unbeaten sides in the tournament, India and South Africa. India won by seven runs to become the third side after the West Indies and England to secure two men's T20 titles. But that margin of victory doesn't even scratch the surface of an amazing match. India lost three early wickets but were then revived by the previously out-of-form Virat Kohli, who made 76 from 59 balls, while Aksar Patel, batting at number 5, made a superb 47 from 31 balls. And with Shivam Dube adding some power at the back end of the innings, contributing 27 from 16 deliveries, India's 176 for 7 looked imposing. But South Africa weren't coward. They lost Two early wickets, but Tristan Stubbs and Quinton de Kock kept them up with the rate before Heinrich Klaassen and David Miller exploded. Klaassen made a brilliant 52 from 27 balls, including five sixes, and South Africa wanted 26 from 24 balls with six wickets in hand when he was dismissed by Hardik Pandya. From there, player of the tournament Jaspreet Boomra, Ashdeep Singh and Hardik bowled unbelievably well at the death and that together with a sensational catch on the boundary at the start of the final over when Surya Kumar Yadav dismissed David Miller meant a first win in this tournament for India since the inaugural edition in 2007. John, let's begin at the end and the obvious question, did South Africa choke on the big occasion? Well, for 35 overs, it didn't look so 30 from 30 balls a runner ball then as you say 26 from 24 in the final analysis though it looks like it yes in the end they were done by bummer's bowling and sky's catch as you mentioned miller hitting a full toss to him of all balls you can receive and i think uh, in the final analysis uh, south africa lacked the extra batting depth and a bit of extra nous Sebash, talk to us about that sensational bowling display at the death by Boomer, Ashdeep and Hardik. They conceded a scarcely believable 22 from the final five overs. Well, after 24 runs of that 15th over from Oxford, uh, nobody thought they would lose. They tried to play off Boomer's 16th over without risk and they succeeded. But uh, I think losing Glasson in the first ball of 17th really hurt their plan. And once Boomer got Johnson in the next over, I think India was uh, just uh, piling up the pressure. Uh, but kudos to the bowling unit, I think uh, they did what South Africa had been doing all the tournament. And Sabash, Ashdeep and Faisal Haq Faruqi of Afghanistan took more wickets in the tournament than Boomer. But listen to these for Boomer's figures across the tournament. 15 wickets, an average of 8.2. But how about this? An economy rate of 4.19. 
Figures like that would have been impressive 40 years ago. But in this modern era of power hitting, surely he's the best bowler in the world, not just in T20 cricket, but across all formats. Well, Boomer really was out of this world. We've been seeing that tagline all over the World Cup and those figures were rare even in ODIs back in the days. Now, this is what he's doing is when bowlers are getting hit for fun and that too at the start and death overs where it's the most pressure situation. I think he was deservedly the player of the tournament and for me, he was player of the final as well. He brought the game back for India. He set the tone for his unit to continue that and to sum up how absurd his bowling was, he gave away just 12 boundaries throughout the tournament. I think some of that was behind the stumps aged out. I don't know how, how the teams played the, the, him going forward. Well, John, for all the excellence of the Indian death bowling, I suspect South Africa's batters will reflect on what might have been and what should have been, leaving aside Parson and Miller, who came so close to finishing the job for the Proteus. I think Tristan Stubbs and Quinton de Kock in particular are going to be replaying their dismissals a fair bit in their own minds. Both gave away their wickets quite cheaply when looking so good, didn't they? Yeah, I don't doubt that they're doing just that. But in T20 cricket, you, know, you have to take risks. and Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. But John, talk to us too about Clarsen's innings. He took, as was mentioned earlier, 24 from Axa's last over. And his six hitting, especially down the ground off the back foot, it almost defies belief, doesn't it? It does, um, particularly with almost no foot movement. Axa was bullied into bowling like, two wides. And then one of the sixes hit the, the roof of the stadium. And it was the fastest uh, 50 ever in a... T20 World Cup final of only 23 balls. Amazing effort. And John, let's talk about two players who won't get the headlines but probably deserve to do so. Axe's innings, that was crucial in joining Virat Kohli to revive India from 34 for three. And then Surya Kumar Yadav's catch on the boundary to deny Miller a six from the first ball of that last over. That was match winning too, wasn't it? Yes, by all accounts, it was uh, Raul Dravid who came up with the decision to push Axe up the order. We joined Coley, who uh, then anchored the innings, and, and Axel took the responsibility to score quickly, hitting four sixes and one four in 47 off 31 balls, all of that in a 72-run partnership with Coley to uh, take India to a recovery situation of 106 for four in what, 13 and a half overs. As far as the catches are concerned, you know there are an increasing number of these brilliantly athletic and inventive boundary catches requiring great skill, athleticism and sharp thinking. And and I think this one, in a final, will be remembered for its timing at the beginning of that final over. Yes, it certainly was a memorable effort. He couldn't have got any closer to the boundary without actually touching it, but uh, he succeeded in avoiding that touch and claiming the catch. Now, Sebash, by my count, India had at least seven players who made match-winning contributions in that final. Virat, Aksa, Shivam Dube with the bat, Arshdeep, Bumrah, Hardik with the ball, plus that catch by Surya Kumar Yadav. That's exceptional, isn't it? Yeah, I think they really played you as a unit in the final bowling. That was fantastic. And even batting the middle order turned up when required. Uh, Dubey hitting those runs just when it mattered and Sky grabbing that catch. Uh, I think few will notice how, how much he runs hit, hit in the final. And when we spoke about making an impact in the T20, and I think this was a brilliant example from India and just the moment in the T20 final. And John, Virat Kohli, Rohit Sharma, Ravindra Jadeja, they've all announced their retirements from T20Is after the match. What do you make of those decisions? I'm not at all surprised by um, Sharma and Kohli. Entirely logical, given that Dravid is stepping down as coach. They ticked a big box. They've got little now to prove. Um, a new coach will arrive, not necessarily one to their liking. And there are new kids on the block, as evidenced by um, the selection uh, for the Tour of Zimbabwe. That's for Jadeja, well, I was surprised by that, but after all, he is 35. He didn't have too big a role at the World Cup. Faced just 22 balls in five innings, scored 35 runs, and only bowled 14 overs, picking up one wicket. So I would think it sounds like a pretty good time to call a day for him as well. And Sebash, your view on the trio's decisions... Could they have kept going, do you think, for the next T20 World Cup, given it's in India and Sri Lanka? Well, I think the decision is perfectly timed. I think it's a time for the young team to carry on the run in home conditions, which will be easy. And knowing ICC and India, we can easily say that all India matches will be played in India. So the youngsters will be faced of the IPL campaign and to defend 
the title will be easier for them. And Sebash, what about a redemption for Hardik too? He spoke after the match, after the hard times he endured in the lead up to the tournament as captain of the cellar dwellers, the Mumbai Indians in the IPL. Does this make up for it? Do you think he was in tears at the end of the game? He was so emotional. Yeah, it surely does. I think he was the unsung hero for the team throughout the campaign, and he showed his worth every money that Mumbai has put in. Uh, he copped all the hit. Showed how tough he is throughout the process. Uh, uh, we were on the bat, that bandwagon that he was r- wronged at, at times. Uh, I think he's front runner to lead the team next. I think that's the difference for playing a country and franchise mix. Uh, he's won over all the doubters, and I think it's a next chapter for his life as well. And John, where does South Africa go from here? Another near miss, which means it's now 25 years since they last won a major ICC men's event. Will this group of players be able to use this as a springboard to future success or or will it create a mental block to getting over the line next time? Ed Muckram said there will be time for reflection, which is inevitable, really. It will be a bitter pill for them to swallow and the taste will linger, I think, for quite some time. Now, what could they, he, have done differently and what will they do next time around faced with a similar situation as Uh, this is what reflection should be about. So I would say they're more likely to use it as a springboard, most of them being young enough to look at it that way and develop a a more battle-hardened skin, which is um, probably the difference between the two sides when it came to the crunch. Well, the final followed two very one-sided semi-finals as India eased past England in Guyana and South Africa overwhelmed Afghanistan in Trinidad. It must be said, both matches took place on substandard pitches, which has been very much a theme of this tournament. John, from England's perspective, they reached the last four after beating Oman, Namibia, the USA and the West Indies. And there are media calls for either head coach Matthew Mott or white ball captain Joss Butler, or both, to be replaced ahead of the next limited overs action in September against Australia. What's your view? Oh, there is a view in uh, in the media, some of the media, that is, that Mott has not been a, a success. However, I think you have to remember he came into an established setup with a number of older players coming to the end of their white ball careers. Failure in the ODI World Cup and the T20 World Cup is, is not a good look. The team needs an overhaul, and I, and I think it's, it should have happened earlier. And I think he should be given the chance to, to actually achieve that. And what it means for Butler, I'm not sure. Understandably, he says he's going to take a break from cricket. He's a very young family, latest edition, only a month or so ago. And I think it depends on how he refreshes. Um, and the big question is, you know, does he want to lead in 2025 and 2026? Then there's a question of who could step in. That same media is talking Harry Brook up. And that's pretty wrong in my view. I think it's far too early. You know, who could do it? I think Zach Crawley is probably a better bet. Well, plenty of decisions to be made for England over the coming weeks. Sebash, what about Afghanistan? A great achievement to reach the semi-finals for the first time. But was it, as we suggested in the previous podcast, a case of them scaling their Everest by reaching that stage and that anything beyond it was always going to be tough to achieve? It looks like that were on the same line, I think. Afghanistan, after getting in the same finals, they were overboard. Then uh, the semi-final was done once the opener way back uh, all tournament it was either Gurbaz or Jadran that made the start and piled up the runs but uh, the middle run never fired and they hardly stood up in the semi-finals as well so South Africa just kept piling up the pressure and bundled up them for a very easy target well now gentlemen before we close the book on the tournament let's have your assessment on whether it was a success it featured matches in the USA to develop the sport in a largely untapped cricket landscape and social media hits and eyeballs were huge in the billions according to the ICC but there was plenty to question about the event there was the schedule with the tournament lasting four weeks the weather the seemingly preferential treatment of India with their fixtures and consistent time timings throughout, although uh, given they bring in most of the revenue to the ICC, perhaps that's fair enough. And the pitches too, which although they produce some compelling cricket, were too often too much in favour of the bowlers. But what did you make of it? John, first of all, then Sebash? I suspect that more or less everybody will regard it as a success. At least it had 20 teams, um, which I think is a move in the right direction. But how will it be judged in 10, 20 years down the line? 
I regard it as tarnished by rain, by the quality of pitches, by the appalling timing, both by month and hour, and the clear, not seemingly, preferential treatment of India. Of course, this matters not a jot to Indians. And their dominance of cricket is now reinforced. I don't think it's healthy for the game's future because they, they don't share very much. And if they continue in this vein, you very well may get a, a fracture occurring in the future. With power comes responsibility, and I see very little of that um, from the Indians side. As we've discussed before, the IPL doesn't have to be two months long. It's very selfish. And after all, you know who agreed to this? Well, of course, the ICC. Subhash, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, adding up to what John said, uh, I think it was a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, the scheduling, the weather, I think that could have been better, but glad that the business end of the tournament came up on scattered. And the uh, US experiment uh, didn't have as big impact as expected, but I think a bit of presence will help the game grow, especially with the USA beating Pakistan and getting into the Super uh, that uh, means they'll play the next World Cup. So I think that that, that is one positive side looking at the growth of the game. Incidentally, India was stuck in Barbados after the final due to Hurricane Beryl. After all, it is the hurricane season in the Caribbean. But their shadow squad is heading to Zimbabwe for a five-match 2020 international series starting on the 6th of July with VVS Laxman coaching the side ahead of an announcement of a replacement for Raul Dravid, who stepped aside. The team is led by Shubh and Gill, and it'll be fascinating to see how many of this squad will be part of the lineup defending the trophy just won when the tournament reconvenes in India and Sri Lanka in 2026. We'll chat about the first two matches of that T20i series in Zimbabwe next time. But uh, as for the here and now, that wraps up the Men's T20 World Cup. The next major ICC event is the Women's T20 World Cup in Bangladesh in October. And the next Men's ICC event, major one, is the Champions Trophy in Pakistan in March next year. And we'll be here for both of those events, plus plenty more at the Wicket. The West Indies women's side have turned things around in spectacular fashion at the end of their tour of Sri Lanka. Having lost the one-day international series 3-0 and then been beaten in the first of three 2020 internationals, they rallied superbly to win matches 2 and 3 of that T20i series to leave with some silverware. Match 2 was rain-affected, with West Indies winning by six wickets with five balls in hand after leg spinner Afi Fletcher took four for 23. And then in the decider, they chased 142 to win as Shemaine Campbell made an unbeaten 41 from 30 deliveries. John, you have to give the West Indies huge credit here, don't you, for this revival at the end of a tour that looked to be heading for the rocks. And surely it was no coincidence that the revival coincided with the return to health of Captain Hayley Matthews, who made 108 runs in the T20i series. Remember, she was ill and missed the back end of the one-dayers. It doesn't seem to have been a coincidence. Uh, in the second match, chasing a DLS-adjusted target of 99 in 15 overs, Sneffy Taylor and Matthews provided an ideal start, 44 runs in 6.5 overs, to ensure that the West Indies were always ahead of the DLS par score. In the third match, Taylor and Matthews put on 60 in an opening stand in just 48 deliveries, after which Matthews paired up with Shemaine Campbell for a 44-ball, 51-run stand. So it looks like um, she has a particular alchemy for this team. Yeah, she had her hand on the tiller there, no doubt about that. But, Sebash, what do you make of this series loss for Sri Lanka, especially ahead of the T20 Asia Cup later this month, which they're hosting? Is it a cause for concern, or, or can they be more reflective? Reflective about it as they did have some good individual performances during the tour as a whole and they, they picked some younger players in the T20i squad as well, didn't they? Yeah, I think the business end was the ODI series. The T20 was uh, experimentation and they're focusing on the Asia Cup. Uh, I think they'll have time to react before the tournament starts. They're playing at home and World Cup's still a long way to go, similar conditions, but uh, I think Asia Cup will be the biggest test and uh, the youngsters will be keen to fire there. Well, that Women's T20 Asia Cup is happening in Dambulla. And from July the 19th, eight sides, Sri Lanka, of course, Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, Nepal, Pakistan, Thailand and the UAE. They'll be facing each other for the title of the continent's top side. We'll cover that off in future episodes of The Wicket.
India's women have dominated their one-off test match against South Africa in Chennai, winning by 10 wickets with just 18 overs left on the final afternoon. They scored the highest total in women's tests, 603 for six declared, making those runs at 5.23 per over. And the 525 runs they scored on day one was a record for one day of a test, men or women. And I was actually at the previous record when Sri Lanka made 509 against Bangladesh in Colombo in 2002. Smithy Mandana and Shafali Verma, they added 292 for the first wicket, the second highest stand in the history of women's test cricket. And Shafali became only the 10th player in women's history to score a test double hundred. She made 205, while Smithy made 149 to go with her scores of 117, 136 and 90 in the One Day International series beforehand. South Africa were bundled out for 266 in their first innings, losing their final six wickets for just 17 runs on the third morning, but they battled superbly in the second innings after following on, as Captain Laura Volvhart made 122. Sun Luce contributed 109, as the pair added 190 for the second wicket, and Nadine de Klerk, she batted for three and a half hours for 61 before she was last out, leaving India just 37 to win after tea on the last day. Off-spinner Snare Rana had match figures of 10 for 188 as she sent down 65.3 overs in the match, and that included 8 for 77 in the first innings. John, it's great, at least from my perspective, to see Test cricket given its day in the hot sun in Chennai, with India now having played three tests in the last six months. But I was interested to read comments by Laura Volhart before the match, saying that unless there's some red ball cricket for her and her players outside of these matches, then perhaps it's time for South Africa's women to forsake the longest format, as the shift in technique is too extreme to make for one-off matches. What do you make of that perspective? And, And could the comments be a genuine fork in the road for the women's game i think she's got a point it is a jump from white ball to red ball cricket and the players need exposure for that and they they need time for preparation sounds like a, a cry for help to me as far as uh, you know cricket south africa are concerned and and maybe for the um, more broadly for the, for the icc and the future of test cricket for women sebash talk to us about shafali verma and smitty mandana incredible achievements by them and for shafali in particular her uh, double hundred exercised a ghost from the UK yet three years ago when she got out for 96 in a test trying to reach three figures with a big hit. Great achievements by those two uh, women. Yeah, I think Safali's double 100 was even more special. Uh, it reminded me how she worked since the scene of test cricket with his usual attacking intent. And Safali is no different. I think her stroke play is next level and her attitude to go with that as well. And the fact that she's just 20 and is already breaking records, I think uh, India got a gem and they're polishing her well. Mandana on the other end, I think she's calm and composed, just made proper partner for Safali. And it's like fire and ice at the top with South Africa they failed to contain. Next up, it's a three-match 2020 international series to round off the tour before India head to the T20 Asia Cup. And we'll speak about those 2020 internationals in our next episode. New Zealand's Silver Ferns are in the UK for a white ball series and things haven't started well for the touring side. They've been thumped in the first two matches of a three-game one-day international series, losing the opener by nine wickets, with England chasing the 157 they required in just 21.2 overs. And it was an almost identical story in match two, with New Zealand bundled out for 141, and England knocking off the runs with eight wickets and a massive 25.3 overs in hand. In the first game, Charlie Dean took 4 for 38 with her off-spin before Tammy Beaumont, with 76 not out, and Maya Bouchier, who made 67. They combined for 137 runs in an opening stand. And in game two, Sophie Eccleston took 5 for 25 with her left-arm spin before Bouchier produced an unbeaten 100 from 88 deliveries. John, we spoke about Maya Bouchier getting her chance to shine on the tour of New Zealand earlier this year, and now she's shining again. This is exceptional stuff from her. Is she the player England have been searching for at the top of the order? 
But let's not forget, in between, she didn't shine. Heading into this series, she not managed to reach the half-century mark since her second ODI innings against Sri Lankan last September. After the match, uh, she said, I've struggled to understand where the purpose of my game is and what I give to the team. I think at 25, probably needs to overcome that uh, introspection to, to kick on. Well, she certainly kicked on in the first two matches of this One Day International series and more power to her for doing so. But, Sebash, what is there to say about New Zealand? We've spoken before on this podcast about how they seem to be a team in decline and these sorts of performances don't uh, do anything to dispel that, do they? Captain Sophie Devine said the players had to look in the mirror to find the answer to this crisis. Is there a way to turn this round or are they in for a miserable tour? Well, touring England is a tough ask for any side and New Zealand in recent times uh, have been out of touch. I think these one-sided matches aren't doing them any favour and looking at the table of the Women's Championship, I think uh, they're yet to face Australia and India and uh, I think they'll need to regroup and rediscover themselves ahead of the business end. Yes, uh, real problems for New Zealand. Zealand at the moment. Let's see if they can turn things round. The series is continuing with the third and final One Day International as we record this podcast before a five-match T20i series, which will act as a build-up for both teams to the Women's T20 World Cup in Bangladesh in October. We'll report back as the tour continues here at The Wicket. Since our previous episode, Sri Lanka head coach Chris Silverwood has tendered his resignation. The former England fast bowler was in the role for just over two years, and during that time, Sri Lanka won the T20 Asia Cup in the UAE in August and September of 2022, and they reached the final of the ODI Asia Cup last year. But they finished ninth in the 2023 won the International Cricket World Cup in India and so failed to qualify for next year's ICC Champions Trophy. And they went out of the recent T20 World Cup in the first round after losses to South Africa and Bangladesh. John, Chris also presided over a period when Sri Lanka were for a while suspended by the ICC for political interference in the governance of the sport. So it can hardly have been said to have been a dull time for him. How do you assess his tenure in the role? and has he rehabilitated his reputation after leaving the England head coach's role rather battered after racking up a succession of test losses? He did remarkably well in his early days in Sri Lanka, but uh, that's tail off. And given the politics of Sri Lankan cricket, the failure to progress at both the ODI and T20 World Cups, it looks like a case of jumping before pushing, and is citing family reasons. Partial rehabilitation, I would say, but I don't think his reputation has been especially enhanced by this stay in Sri Lanka. Subash, does Chris have a legacy, do you think? After all, during his time in the role, Dilshan Madushanka, Asitha Fernando, Matisha Patirana, Nuan Thusara, they came through to bolster the pace attack, but at the same time, the batting has continued to be questionable, hasn't it? Well, he fared out well in the red ball cricket. Uh, I think the performance in ICC events did not do justice to his work. They won the Asia Cup in first year, runners up in the next one in 2023, but uh, not being able to make the mark in World Cups was bad and not being able to make it the Champions Trophy. I think bowling was exceptional, uh, even in this edition where they just won out of four. I think they were on the mark, but uh, it's batting that's really not been able to carry the legacy that Sri Lanka had. Yes, batting has been a, a big problem for Sri Lanka in major events over the recent past. Sri Lanka's task now is to get someone in place to take over from Chris Silverwood ahead of the Test Series against England in England that starts on August the 21st. The first Test match of England's men's team's summer is fast approaching and that's the first of three games against the West Indies at Lords from July the 10th. And England's selection has brought some real talking points. Included is uncapped Jamie Smith, Surrey's number two wicketkeeper, who gets his opportunity on both sides of the stumps ahead of Ben Folkes, the keeper in the winter in India, and Johnny Bairstow, both of whom have been dropped. Shoaib Bashir, the 20-year-old off-spinner who took 17 wickets in three tests in India, has been preferred to his Somerset teammate Jack Leach. And Ollie Robinson, who managed one injury-plagued test in the 
winter has been replaced by Nottinghamshire fast bowler Dylan Pennington, who has 29 first-class wickets this season, while Gus Atkinson of Surrey, who was a permanent drinks waiter in the winter, could also make his test debut. Also remember, James Anderson is set for his final test appearance at Lord's. John, the inclusion of Jamie Smith ahead of Ben Folkes and also the basball poster boy Johnny Bairstow is major news. Does it surprise you? Uh, Bairstow's omission doesn't surprise me. So I don't think he's been the same since that uh, injury on the golf course. It is a ruthless decision, but not as much as Folks, you know, who's a superior keeper and a decent batter. I think Smith probably fits the buzzball image. As you say, he's not even the first choice keeper for his county behind Folks, And I think that is a surprise. And John, is this then the end for both Ben Folks and Johnny Bairstow at test level now, do you think? I think for Bairstow, probably yes. And um, Folks, possibly. It depends on how Smith performs. And there are other contenders to keep wickets. Sebastian? Similarly, is Ollie Robinson looking at the end of his test career, given both uh, Gus Atkinson and Dylan Pennington are considerably younger than him? Well, it seems to be the way, and Robinson is grabbing headlines for wrong reasons in the county as well. Uh, Atkinson has been around the team waiting for his chance, and Pennington looks to be better option is wise and can up that a bit too. I think Broad and Anderson's vacancy, uh, everyone thought Robinson would be covering that, but uh, doesn't seem to be the case. And Sebash, what about the inclusion of Shoaib Bashir? who's been on loan this season at Worcestershire because of Jack Leach's presence at Somerset. Does uh, Shoaib's inclusion surprise you? Well, I think a lot of us were surprised, but uh, Rofki highlighted the case saying Basir is their go-to spinner now. But the situation is indeed quite su- surprising with Somerset choosing to hold on to Leach and uh, England preferring Basir. Uh, Key, however, said Leach is second in the pecking order, so I think the competition is still there. Well, only three of the West Indies squad featured in the T20 World Cup lineup. That's fast bowler Alzari Joseph, who's vice-captain. Shamar Joseph, who uh, will be out to recreate his form in his debut test series against Australia at the start of the year. And spinner Gudakesh Motti. The dust has barely settled on the men's T20 World Cup and already it's time to look forward to the second edition of Major League Cricket, the USA's attempt to jump on the T20 franchise bandwagon while popularising and professionalising the sport in the country. Six teams are set to play a total of 25 matches at two venues. That's Grand Prairie in Texas, which staged four games during that T20 World Cup, and 1,200 miles east at Church Street in North Carolina, which will host nine matches in this tournament. Three of the six sides have a familiar ring to their names, MI New York, the Texas Super Kings, and the Los Angeles Night riders as they're under the umbrellas of IPL franchises and the other teams are the Washington Freedom, the San Francisco Unicorns and the Seattle Orcas. The defending champions are MI New York who beat the Seattle Orcas in a remarkable final last year with Rashid Khan taking three for nine before Nicholas Puran made an incredible 137 not out from only 55 balls as New York chased down 184 with four overs and seven wickets in hand. But if you don't remember that match or the tournament, then you wouldn't be alone. But this time, off the back of the USA reaching the Super 8s of the T20 World Cup, this could be the perfect time for the league to grow its profile. After all, it's got some stellar names playing. For example, the Knight Riders have Sonny on the Rhine, Andre Russell and Adam Zampa in their squad. MI New York are captained by Kyron Pollard and also include World Cup finalists Kagiso Rabada and Anrich Norkia. San Francisco Unicorns, they're led by Pat Cummins after the Australians signed a four-year deal with the franchise. Seattle Orcas have Heinrich Klaassen and have added one of the USA's World Cup heroes, Aaron Jones, to their squad after he was originally not picked during the draft. Texas Super Kings, they're captained by Faf Duplessis, and Washington Freedom features Steve Smith, Travis Head and Glenn Maxwell. Sebash, you were in Dallas last month for the T20 World Cup, and uh, you reported the MLC was the tournament that was more visible than the ICC event. What are your expectations for MLC? Well, the MLC should be the best version at this time with players involved, and uh, I think there's some interest going for the game as well and with 
lots of World Cup stars involved, it will be easier for new eyes to get into the game. And uh, as I mentioned previously as well, uh, the venue uh, was all branded with MLC stuff. And uh, I think uh, Dallas is a good place for cricket. We saw a lot of almost full crowd in all the four matches played there. So with all, a lot of matches going to be held there and uh, a lot of South Asian diaspora as well, I think that the game will have some interest uh, in comparison to the previous editions. John, MLC have secured a real headline by getting that long-term commitment from Australia's test and 50-over World Cup winning captain Pat Cummins, the man who led Sunrisers Hyderabad to the IPL final. It looks like a tournament that's only going to get bigger, doesn't it? Uh, I don't know, bigger in terms of what? Money, viewers, top players... From a distance, I'm I'm convinced. I mean, Cummins is a top coup. The event comes on top of the T20 World Cup. Uh, interesting to hear that um, Subash said that uh, you know there were pretty full houses in Dallas. I'm not sure about this tournament yet. I think it's um, it's a slow burn for me, really. Cricket in America. Well, it's been awarded List A status by the ICC, which means all the players' achievements will count in their 2020 records. John, if you were the 100 or the Canada Global T20 League, two other T20 events that tend to compete for players in this period of time, how worried would you be about the future as you look across at MLC? I think with uh, franchise cricket, you just follow the money, to mention the famous line in all the president's men. The MLC runs from July the 5th to 29th, so it doesn't cut across the 100. The Canadian event starts on 25th of July, concludes on the 11th of August, so there's partial overlap. The heavy focus of West Indian, Pakistani and Bangladesh players. So I don't think there's a worry just yet. Well, we'll just have to uh, wait and see whether those worries intensify or dissipate. Rest Mm -hmm. assured, we'll keep across the happenings in the USA at MLC and report back to you on future episodes here at The Wicket. And finally, gentlemen, as we always do, let's hear from you about something that's caught your attention this week in the world of cricket. John, we'll start with you. Uh, two things. One one is the growth in Italian cricket, but that's, um, we'll cover that uh, another time. Uh, some quite extraordinary performances by, uh, by them in T20 cricket. But in the longer format, in the county championship in England and Wales, it was an astonishing performance by Leicestershire's number eight, Louis Kimber, which rewrote the record books. Um, he scored 243 in a losing course against Sussex. Uh, in Hove. It was the fastest double hundred in terms of balls faced, 100. He hit the most sixes, 21, and scored the most runs in an over when he plundered 43 off the aforementioned England uh, seamer Ollie Robinson in county championship history. And I say, all in a losing course, getting to within 18 runs of victory. Yes, absolute agony there in one respect. They were set 464 to win Leicestershire. They were 175 for seven and then came Kimber's onslaught. And that over that John mentioned, Ollie Robinson bowling to Kimber, it went six, another six with a no ball thrown in, four, six, four, six and another no ball there, four, six and another no ball. And then a single off the last ball of the over. 43 runs in a single over. Absolutely remarkable. And, well, it just shows the magic of uh, first-class cricket and the ability of uh, the long game to throw up little incidents like that. Because from 175 for seven for uh, Leicestershire to get to uh, 445, and they did that in something like uh, 40 overs, Absolutely astonishing stuff. Thanks for bringing that to our attention, John. Subash, what have you got for us? Well, Dasun Shanaka was on fire with both bat and ball in the LPL. Candy easily won the match and his dollar performance was something Sri Lanka missed. I think in the US League especially with both matches winnable, uh, he was missing. Yes, Dasun Shanaka and the LPL. Two things uh, we'd almost forgotten uh, were were, uh, coming round. LPL, uh, another event on the T20 treadmill, just getting underway, uh, well, before the dust had even settled on the T20 World Cup. And rest assured, we'll keep our eyes on that LPL for uh, any stories 
going around and we'll bring them to you of course here at the wicket well that's all for this episode of the wicket we'll be back with more cricket chat soon from the gulf region asia and worldwide as ever please don't forget to like subscribe and comment on what you've heard wherever you get your podcast but that's all for now this is brian murgator along with john pike and sebash hammergain thanks so much for listening we look forward to your company again next time goodbye goodbye goodbye